So, welcome everybody. Um, today's speaker is Felix Schulze from the University of Warwick, and he will talk about the mean curvature flow with generic initial data. Thank you very much for coming, and please go ahead. Yeah, so thank you to all the organizers for the kind invitation. It's a big pleasure to speak in the seminar. Um, so I'll be speaking about mean curvature flow with generic initial data, and this is joint work with Otis Churros from Stanford, Kyung Su Choi from Kias, and Christos Mantulidis from Rice. Um, since I don't think the, the, the audience is not so big, I would suggest don't hesitate to interrupt me. I'm happy to answer any questions and try to explain things in more detail if something is not clear. Yeah. Um, so this is the outline a bit. Um, I'll first give a bit of background on the mean curvature flow. I guess a lot of you will know mean curvature flow or geometric flows anyway. So I'll try to be a bit more brief on that, but please interrupt me if something there is not clear. And I guess as everyone knows, sort of one of the central questions in these geometric flows is to understand singularities. And for mean curvature flow, there were, there's a notion of generic singularities. It'll sort of now explain sort of what generic means here and um, why these are called generic. Um, and then there will be two sets of results. So the first results are sort of some earlier results um, about perturbative results, sort of in what sense can we make a flow generic? Yeah. And I'll explain the, the, the main tool for that. These are these ancient one sided flows. And uh, in the very end, I'll explain a bit sort of that sort of under, under an extra condition, we have later realized that. Which is restrictive, yeah. It doesn't give the full result, but we can give us a quicker proof of some of the results, a stronger proof of some of the results under this low entropy condition, which I will explain in the very end. Okay. Okay, now here a bit to the background. And as I said, please don't hesitate to interrupt and ask questions. Um, so we consider a smooth mean curvature flow of hypersurfaces in Rn plus one. Yeah? So ambient dimension is n plus one and we have hypersurfaces of dimension n here, a smooth flow. So these are a smooth family of hypersurfaces. Um, and one says that this is a mean curvature flow. If you take the, the speed of the evolution, you take the normal part. Uh, and if that is equal to the mean curvature vector, since we're in co-dimension one, we can say this is sort of the scalar mean curvature times a choice of unit normal. Uh, and what is the mean curvature? The mean curvature here is just in our uh, convention, the sum of the principal curvatures. So it's a trace of the second fundamental form. Yeah? Um, okay. Now, a sort of a good way, sort of for mean curvature flow, to think about the flow is to think about its space time track. Yeah? Now, so what do we do? We take the surface at, at time t and put it in the time slice t. So we're in Rn plus one cross R, it's space time. So it's not usual space time, it's not the Lorentz manifold. It's just, you add this additional dimension now. So this would be the surface at time t cross t. Now, let me give you a picture here. Yeah? So you can imagine this maybe a bit better. Yeah? You all would have seen sort of like, okay, you have a sphere here. And now if you would let this sort of, yeah sphere or convex curve, yeah, you let this shrink. So this will shrink here sort of down sort of to a round point. Yeah? How would the space-time track lo look like? Yeah? So this is, let me put in here. So here we have the time direction and here we have R2. And here we have the time T. Yeah? And so the space-time track now here with this, of this curve would look like it looks like a uh, downwards pointing parabola. Yeah. So this is sort of, and each slice of this parabola gives the shrinking circle at time t. You see the circle accelerates as it goes to the final time. And that would be kind of the singular point where we have the singular, uh, the singularity here. And that would be sort of the final time. And usually it's called capital T. Okay. Now let's do a bit more sort of an, a bit more difficult picture, but this, this illustrate, illustrates this. So um, I guess all of you have seen sort of this, let me, I'll draw it first and then you erase it later and, and draw the space-time picture. Like this thing is called a dumbbell. See the mean curvature flow, you have this kind of rotation symmetric surface. 
here we sort of like two spheres joined by a neck. And at a later time, this sort of might shrink down here and the neck sort of tightens, uh, but it tightens quicker than these two spheres can, can pinch off. Uh, and then in the end, you get kind of a singularity where sort of you get this, I've seen this in Ricci flow as well, uh, where you have this kind of this, this singularity forming here, where sort of on the microscopic level, you would see like a, something which looks like a cylinder, explain this later, this sort of a singularity model on the cylinder. And then you have these two separate bits here, which you would think sort of would, would evolve by itself. Uh, so, okay, now let's go back. Let's erase this. Okay, so let me draw the initial, so I'll, I'll kill one dimension now. So it's again, I'm here in R2. Let's think of like, just keep this extra dimension in mind. Uh, so, okay, so this is the initial surface, okay? This is our dumbbell. I can't draw in four dimensions. Um, so this is why I'm doing it this way. And now how would the space-time track look like? So the space-time track of this here would look like, would look like this here. Yeah? So you see you have here these level sets where it's a graph of a function here because it's mean convex. So this would be moving to the inside yeah? where this neck is tightening. But here at this level, that would be this, the first singular time where you have this neck pinch forming. And now these two things bubble off and here they would be contracting down to two spheres. Yeah? So you have like three singularities here. This would be the singularity where the neck pinch happens. And this would be like two final spherical singularities. Okay, so in that sense, it's a good way to have to think about the flow as a geometric object by itself. Okay. Are there any questions regarding this picture? Okay. Good. So, what are important properties? Yeah? And many of you will have seen this. Yeah? Maybe the most fundamental one. Okay, maybe let's first note, okay, this mean curvature flow is the L2 gradient flow of the area. So it's the quickest way, uh, if you compare with other speeds with the same L2 norm, to decrease the area. Another important property comes from the strong maximum principle. Felix, Felix yeah. let me ask you a question just to slow you down. So you you drew the space-time track yeah. as if it were a, uh, a smooth, hypersurface in space-time. Is it really as smooth as you indicated? Um, no, smooth, so this, smooth, this, this thing is not really smooth around here. So that is, that, that I think was called in mini cosy I've shown it, I think it's C11, but you don't know if it's C2 around there. Okay, that's it's right. Not, it's not C2. No, I think it's not C2. Yeah, I actually proved that. It, yeah, yeah. It's yes. yeah, yeah. It's it's C one one. It's C one one. Yes, it's only C one one there. Yeah. Thanks, both you guys. But yeah, you know, at least sort of it gives a good picture of what what you can expect. No. Okay, so here's a, a very sort of um, basic fundamental property. Yeah. You know? So this means if we just do it for curve shortening flow, if you have two initial surfaces, you know, which are initially disjoint, huh? then uh, two solutions, let's call this a M1 zero, and this is M2 zero, huh? then if you, if you evolve this one and that one, the evolution will, will stay disjoint, or since the flow is translation invariant, it's the same thing as meaning that the, that the distance is between the two solutions is increasing in time. Huh? So you can't have at any point that these two points, that these two flows touch, yeah? then you can use the strong maximum principle and argue that the flow had, flows had to be equal before. Yeah? Okay. And so why is, why is this so helpful? Um, I'll explain later. The important thing is that this is a very fundamental property, which will also still be true for non-smooth solutions. Yeah? So even if we look at weak solutions, this is still a property which these weak solutions still obey, yeah? uh, the, the appropriate weak solutions. And that's, this we will use this later in, a, in an important way. Okay, now 
we have seen this avoidance principle, finite existence time means just the following thing, assume you have an initial surface. So I'm trying not to draw a bit sort of higher dimensional here, compact. Now we can always enclose this by a big sphere. And we can compute the evolution of a big sphere. It contracts to a point in finite time. The two solutions have to avoid each other. So we know we get um, sort of singularities or something has to happen, something has to disappear. Okay, and now what I've sketched already before um, for mean curvature flow, there are different notions of um, evolutions through singularities. Yeah? So one way one can prove, for example, using work of, of, of Tom, yeah, that there's always a integral Bracky flow. It's sort of it's 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 a it's it's a family of of moving varifolds or uh, Radon measures, which for which are varifolds for almost every time, which in a weak sense satisfy integrated versions of the mean curvature flow equation. You can for the experts here, what we'll be using here are unit regular. So this means if you have a a point which is backward smooth with multiplicity one, then it's also a little bit smooth in, in forward and can't forward time and can't disappear. And cyclic mod two means that even these weak flows still have a weak notion of interior and exterior. Yeah? And but these solutions are possibly non-unique. Yeah? So, so they one can show a sort of a weak strong uniqueness as long as a smooth solution exists, then these weak solutions agree. But if they're kind of bad singularities, yeah, it could happen that past such a bad singularity, um, there are sort of non-unique evolutions past that singularity. Okay, so to, to understand sort of singularities, sort of one of the main tools here um, in mean curvature flow is Huskin's monotonicity formula. And I guess everyone has seen this, you take um, the backwards heat kernel, where you scale this here to the to the factor in front to the dimension of the evolving surface. Yeah, so this is a, a heat kernel which at the point x zero t zero in space time. So in this is also the space time picture is helpful here that concentrates more or less to a delta function. And what you then look at is you you integrate this backwards heat kernel. Now yeah? you have a time prior to time t zero. You integrate this over your uh, over your surface. So this gives you a function in time t. Yeah? And if you differentiate this, you can show that the right-hand side you get is non-positive. So this means this is a decreasing quantity in time. Yeah? It's non-linear. Yeah? And like similar to the monotonicity formula for minimal surfaces, you can um, this can be used to understand singularity. Yeah? And so what is the idea here? The so first thing is if you take that quantity here before you differentiate it, it yeah, now you go, you take a singular time, you go back in time, a factor r squared. You just, just do this so, the, so r is has sort of the dimension of, of space because space and time in the parabolic equation, time always uh, scales quadratically in relation to space. Yeah? Now you go back r. This is a monotone quantity. Yeah? This is called the Gaussian density ratios. Yeah? This is similar to to area ratios for minimal surfaces, that's a monotone quantity. And then you get sort of the limit is called the Gaussian density, which would be like the, uh, the density for minimal surfaces. So a quantity which you can use to understand so to get first information on singularity formation. For example, on a smooth point, one can easily check that this Gaussian density is equal to one. Yeah? And any singular point has density bigger than one. Yeah? It's similar to minimal surfaces. Okay, now if you want to understand singularities, yeah, um, the natural thing to do is so it turns out that similar to minimal surface, you know, if you're minimal surface, then if you scale the ambient space by a factor lambda, a minimal surface stays a minimal surface. Yeah? So you have a natural scaling which preserves the class of objects you look at. Now, for mean curvature flows, you know, the natural scaling is parabolic scaling. So you do um, you take take a factor lambda positive, you scale space. So you think now of the space-time picture. You know, we're sc scaling the space-time picture where you have this, this space-time track here. So you scale space by a factor lambda and time by a factor lambda squared. For example, if you think of this 
backwards parabola of a shrinking uh, of a shrinking uh, sphere or a shrinking circle that is exactly invariant under such a scaling because it's a parabola. Now the idea is so um, this parabolic scaling sends a mean curvature flow again to a mean curvature flow and gives kind of a magnifying lens when you want to look at sort of a singularity forming. Yeah? So the idea is we do the following. Assume you have a you want to understand sort of how the flow behaves around the point x0 here. Yeah? That could be you think of one of the singular points. You translate your flow such that this singular point becomes the origin in space time. Yeah? And now you start dilating up. So we're looking more or less at negative time before uh, time zero. And one can then show, for example, um, using uh, compactness theorem for Bracky flows, that you can actually find a weak limit here. Now you can always, you have natural area bounds, you can blow up and get a weak limit, you know, which again is a Bracky flow. You know? So these natural area bounds are enough. And um, if this limit would be unique, just the uniqueness would already give that this, that this limit in the end has to be invariant under the scaling. But since it's not clear if this limit is unique, it might depend on this sequence of scalings. Yeah, One can still use the monotonicity formula and show that this limit that you get is invariant under this parabolic scalings for negative time. Again, this is very similar to like for minimal surfaces, where if you want to understand the singularity, you to the limit of scalings, you use the monotonicity formula to see that you get a minimal surface, which is invariant under scaling, so it's a minimal cone. Uh, here you get a, uh, uh, a solution, a mean curvature flow, which is invariant for negative time under parabolic scalings. And if you translate this, you see that this, this limiting flow actually, since it's invariant under parabolic scaling, it only depends on the time minus one slice. So you can get the, the whole limit flow actually as a scaling of the time minus one slice. And sure, then you have an, a parabolic equation. And if everything depends only on one slice, then this parabolic equation, that's the mean curvature flow equation, turns into an elliptic equation. And here the elliptic equation turns into a prescribed mean curvature equation. So the mean curvature is given by, of this self shrinker here, yeah? the singularity model is given by the position vector at each point, you project it to the normal space and tie, tie a factor of minus one half. Yeah? You can check, for example, on a shrinking sphere, that is always true. Yeah? And we call something like this a self-shrinker. Yeah? This is sort of like the first order singularity model for mean curvature flow. Any questions regarding this? I guess not many people have seen this. Yeah? Okay. Now there's another characterization of these self shrinkers, which will be important later. Yeah? So you look at this here and you see, okay, you think about, okay, is this possibly an Euler-Lagrange equation of a good functional? You know, the mean curvature is the Euler-Lagrange equation of the area functional and possibly maybe how can we create this minus X perp over two now? Yeah? And if you think quick, not doesn't take very long to come up with the following functional here, that if you take this, the following Gaussian area, this factor is unimportant, but so if you integrate e to the minus x squared over four huh, over the, uh, with respect to the area, then the Euler-Lagrange equation of that function is exactly the Schrinker equation. Huh? So, these are, so these are critical point of this, of this functional here, but if you again look at this, you see this, you can consider this factor which appears here, it's just a factor coming from a conformal metric. Yeah? From a conformal deformation of the metric. So if you take your metric as the Euclidean metric in the background, you take this conformal factor here, then you see that actually self shrinkers are minimal surfaces in this conformally deformed metric. But you see this metric is not very nice. Huh? It actually has only finite diameter and infinity, infinity is sort of a finite distance away. Huh? So it's incomplete. It's not such a great metric to do, to do uh, calculus variations in. And you can actually check that functional is not convex. So variation will very likely not give you, give you a minimal surfaces in this metric. What are examples? Yeah. So the very basic example yeah, is just, okay, what is a very simple self shrink is just a plane through the origin. Yeah? Okay. That's just, if you have a smooth point, that's the, that's the model. Yeah. Which, which is a plane which is static in time. We have seen the shrinking sphere already. Yeah? Uh, so this is this, that's the sphere here. Yeah. 
no? shrinking sphere. Um, but if you have a shrinking sphere, you can take products with R, so you get shrinking cylinders. Yeah, you can take any any dimension of the straight factor. And so these are sort of still all very nice models. Yeah, they're all convex. They're all mean convex. And what actually Huskin proved in the 90s, you can show actually if you have initial surface with this mean convex, so the initial speed points in one direction, then um, mean convexity is preserved. Why is mean convexity preserved? You can see this is actually a consequence of the avoidance principle. More as you can think of mean convexity is kind of a differentiated version of the avoidance principle. Now, if you have something with, let's say, positive mean curvature initially, the solution will move to the inside. The avoidance principle will say that will be preserved for all times if you take the infinitesimal version of that, that exactly means you, that mean convexity is preserved. Yeah? So in some sense, avoidance principle is kind of a zero order version of mean convexity if you want to use that in some way. We'll see this later, this is helpful. But what Huskin showed, if you're mean convex, so if you have a negative mean curvature, you can show these, these cylinders here are the only, the only possibilities for, for singularities. Okay, now, but one can ask, okay, are there other examples of, of singularities? Yeah, here's the very first example. It uh, was uh, found by the Anginent, and this is a torus of revolution. Yeah? It's not sort of the, the cross section is not a round sphere. Yeah? So don't be sort of, uh, don't take my picture here for granted. So it's a torus of revolution, and that torus shrinks down to a point while keeping its shape. Okay. And there are other examples here. Yeah? You can think of the following example. Um, for example, you take a round sphere. And you intersect the round sphere with a plane, both centered at the origin, yeah, like this. That is some kind of singular shrinker. Okay, but we have seen here before now yeah, that uh, the shrinkers are kind of a prescribed mean curvature equation. And I guess every one of you have everyone has seen CMC surfaces and desingularization of CMC surface. So if you have two CMC surfaces with the same mean curvature intersecting transversely, then usually you can glue in a sherp type surface with very high genus around this intersection line and hope to desingularize. And this is what Kapuleas, Klein, and Möller did. And also uh, doing at the same time, you take R2 union S2 with radius two. This is like the shrinking sphere. And then you can get a self shrinker. And here's a one of the pictures, pictures of, um, from Tom Ilman and out of, his, out of his lecture notes. Yeah. Um, here is how I think he uses the Bucky wall that I remember right yeah, to, find, to find this picture. Yeah. So what Kaponias, Klein, and Möller and Nguyen improved that you can take the genus very, very large. And then you find something like this. I think it's not clear if you can find it with already this this exact configuration here. Maybe to explain the picture a little bit better, it's, it's good to have something like a picture from the side in mind. Yeah? Now, what you see here is you have the plane here and the sphere, yeah? and one has drilled in holes in this direction, and then also so alternating holes in that direction. Yeah? So when we look in here, yeah, we see sort of the bottom of this sphere, there's this plane going through, and this is sort of, that's sort of something which is connecting the bottom component with this interior component. Okay, so this is sort of an example of this. But what you also see in this picture, and this is sort of something I want to stress later, is that somehow you know, from for CMC surfaces to get CMC surface, you know, one knows you have to do some kind of force balancing. As a kind of forces which have to be balanced, yeah. And you see also these necks, they actually look, look rather balanced. Yeah? So there seems to be some force balancing at work. So this seems to be kind of a rather instable configuration. The other interesting thing here also is that when, uh, when, they, when Kapuleas, Klein, and Müller and Goyen did this desingularization, yeah? um, what you usually do, you do this as a singular perturbation problem. Yeah? So you, you start from the singular configuration and try sort of to find an approximate solution where you glue in sort of like a, a sort of a bent shirk surface around here, and then you use the, the inverse function theorem and try to find an exact solution. 
But what they found out is that actually this is not a local problem. There are terms appearing, which to kill off these terms, they actually needed to change sort of this cone at infinity here. So it's not flat R2 here, but actually this is kind of a wiggly plane. So if you go to infinity, this is, looks like a cone here, you know, and it wiggles around. It's not the flat cone. You know? So there, there are some terms which are non, which are not local. You know? So you need to do kind of, uh, kind of a more global perturbation to be able to do this here. And I'll, I'll see this, you'll see this in a moment. The other thing I wanted to point out here. Um, okay, now just a little bit about the structure of self shrinkers. So I'll come to this point here now. Okay, um, now the first thing is one can understand the asymptotic cone of a self shrinker. So you just sort of scale down the self shrinker. So what is the same thing as sort of scaling this down? If you look at the space time track of the self shrinker and look at the time zero slice, because you can think of lambda. It's just being this, this factor squared of minus lambda t. Yeah? Now, if you think this is squared of minus lambda t, yeah? uh, squared of minus t, this is just sort of how the what, what the shrinker would evolve into at time zero. And then you can use the monotonicity formula, very easily see that that what you get at time zero is actually a cone in the in the in the in the just as a set, yeah? and you see that this convergence is in Hausdorff distance. Yeah? You always have an asymptotic cone. For example, for the cylinder, it's a line. For what we've seen here now, it would be kind of a smooth cone, which is only singular at the origin. Can I interrupt okay. with a little question? Uh, yeah, so, so the Kapolea said all, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's sufficient to do this wiggling, but it is the necessity of the wiggling? Yes. Off the theorem? So, off the, yeah, that's, yeah. Okay, um, so, from motivated of this picture, we say a shrinker is asymptotically conical if this cone at infinity is smooth and the convergence to the cone is smooth, yeah, with multiplicity one. Yeah? Now here is sort of answering uh, Rob, answering your question. Yeah? Um, there's a, a result of Lu Wang that actually this cone at infinity determines the shrinker uniquely, at least any connected component to it. Yeah? So this means you need to wiggle. Yeah. Because if it would be flat, the only the only connected smooth shrinker asymptotic to the flat R two is flat R two. Would be the flat, yeah. Okay, that's mm -hmm. what I thought. But 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 how, okay. I was leading into a question I'll ask you later. So never mind for now. Okay. Okay. Since time is getting a bit short, I will not explain how to get this. Well, it's not not it's it's a backwards uniqueness result. Sort of you think of this idea here flowing into the cone, and then this comes from a backwards uniqueness result. For, for me, for, for, for the heat equation where it's for me curvature flow. Another result of Lu um, shows that if you take a two-dimensional self-shrinker in R3 with finite genus, yeah, then you can prove that um, it has only cylindrical or smoothly conical ends. Just for the experts, where does this come from? Just because time is getting a bit short, you can prove that if you go at this cone at time zero, we can see that actually, um, if you take a tangent flow at time zero, each tangent flow at time zero has to, if you're not at the origin, has to split a line. So the cross section has to be a one dimensional shrinker, but the only one dimensional shrinkers are, which are embedded is the, is the circle and the plane. So if you, have, if you see a circle, you get a cylindrical end. Uh, so it's asymptotic to a cylinder. And if you get a plane, then you can actually follow that whole cross section around and you get an, a smooth asymptotically conical end. So the main part of her work here was actually to prove that if you're embedded with finite genus, that these, that these ends don't appear with multiplicity. So that's the main part of her work, to prove that you don't have multiplicity. You don't have sheets coming together there in this question. But that more or less says, OK, this picture of looking at asymptotically conical guys is not so far away. You could have uh, cylindrical ends huh? still. Yeah? Um, there's an odd conjecture by Tom. Huh? So which is sort of extending this uh, this uniqueness result here, which is sort of uh, of Lou for uh, in the asymptotically conical case to the cylinder case says, okay, if you have an asymptotic cylindrical end, then the whole shrinker just can be on the cylinder. There's nothing else. Okay. It's not an easy question. I think many people have tried. Um, uh, so it's still open, yeah. So. Um, 
the another important result is a result of due to Simon Brendle in 2016. Yeah, is now you remember this picture we had where we have this desingularization. There's a lot of genus sitting there. You need to drill a lot of holes to get this guy. Yeah. So the question is if you have no genus, and this also answer answers an earlier conjecture of Tom. Yeah, that uh, if you have no genus, then the only embedded shrinkers uh, in R3 is the sphere or the cylinder. There's nothing else. Uh, so that, for example, means if you have an asymptotically conical shrinker, it always carries genus. Uh, so if there's no asymptotically conical shrinker without genus. Uh, that's important for our stuff later. Yeah. So more or less asymptotically conical singularities uh, 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 carry some energy which you can sort of quantify in genus. Okay, now what, are, what is the problem here? You've seen sort of, uh, and there are many more examples, there's a zoo of singularities. Uh, if you're not mean convex, yeah, or have some curvature condition, there's no real hope of classifying these shrinks. Yeah? Now, on the other hand, if you, for example, know you only have spherical or generalized cylindrical singularities, also in higher dimensions, then there's very good partial regularity results by calling a mini cosy. You know that the singular set has very small measure that goes back to work of Brian White. You know it's rectifiable, you have uniqueness of tangent flows, and you know a lot. Huh? And what you also know is by work of Hershkowitz and White, and now more recently, this resolution of the mean convex neighborhood conjecture, that if you have a flow which has only mean convex singularities, or like these cylindrical and spherical singularities, yeah, then the evolution through these singularities is unique. So the flow doesn't need to be mean convex. Yeah? If you're mean convex, you always get uniqueness as for the weak evolution. But if you know that only the singularities are of this mean convex type, then you know there can't be sort of there can't be kind of, there can't have a bifurcation happening after a singularity. Yeah? It's, it's unique through the singularity. Now, in general, it's much harder sort of to control the size of a singular set and sort of understand possible non-uniqueness if you have. Singularities, which are, for example, modeled on these asymptotically conical shrinkers. But there's an old conjecture of Huskin that a generic mean curvature flow should only have spherical and cylindrical singularities. But the question is, what does generic mean? Yeah. It wasn't really specified in that conjecture. Yeah. But in some sense, that's what you expect. You expect that these other singularities are in some sense unstable. Yeah. So one should be able to perturb them away. Um, now, there was sort of uh, groundbreaking work of calling in Mini Cosi, which showed that, and I'll explain this later, in a precise sense, the only linearly stable singularity models are spheres and cylinders. So if you, if you in the right sense, ask for linear stability of the singularity model, then you only get spheres and cylinders. Yeah. So more or less, they're up to second order. So what is the idea? Um, all, this, all these, all these self-shrinkers have some natural instabilities, which come just from translation and scaling. Uh, you can always show the translation creates an instability, and scaling creates an instability. If you mod out by these by these instabilities, which come from translation and scaling, and ask after modding out by these, which models are still stable, which are then stable. Uh, for example, for this for this Gaussian area functional, after modding out by these natural instabilities, the only stable models are spheres and cylinders. That's sort of the, the statement in a nutshell. Um, what they did using this, yeah, they used okay, so this gives kind of a linear model, yeah, sort of use linear theory, and okay, then they show okay, they show if you have kind of a compact singularity model, yeah, okay, then linear theory is very is still quite strong, yeah. Then, for example, if you have a singularity forming, it's, for example, modeled on this undulant torus shrinking down. Yeah? You, you wait until you're just before the singularity, then you can make a uh, sort of, a, you can stop the flow, make a small perturbation, and make sure that that flow doesn't run into that singularity anymore. Yeah? And then, under the assumption that the next singularity is again compact, yeah? you can then sort of iterate that procedure and get a result from there. Yeah? Now, but that is clearly only a partial answer sort of to this conjecture. Yeah? Now, here the, sort of the important question is how can one sort of 
perturb away non-compact singularity models, yeah, for example, such an asymptotically conical shrinker. Yeah? And what you actually would like to do, you would say, okay, I only want to wiggle the initial data. And maybe I can even sort of wiggle the initial data and wiggle it in such a way that my flow has only sort of non-generic, it's only generic singularities, but even successively. So even after the first singularity, kind of make sure that the second one is also generic, and the third one, and so on. Uh, that's sort of the, what you actually would like to do. Now, and here's sort of this 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 our first result, yeah. And let me just you can do something similar in higher dimensions, but then it's not so general. No? Now let's start with a closed embedded surface in R three. Then the statement is you can sort of do an arbitrary small C infinity perturbation of the initial surface. So you get the following thing. Now you look at the weak mean curvature flow M prime yeah, of, of M prime of the small perturbation. Then either you get this what you actually hope for that this this weak solution or you know, this weak mean curvature flow through singularities has only spherical and cylindrical tangent flows until it goes extinct. Yeah, so if you can just wiggle just the initial data a tiny little bit, and then you know for all time, even past singularities, you have you're as good as you can hope for. Yeah, and or still something bad can happen. We, this is still the bad scenario. So you can do this up to some singular time capital T. And there you have a tangent flow where, where two scenarios are ha can happen. The first scenario to you know, so Tom has proven that in dimension for two dimensional surfaces, the tangent flow is always smooth. You, know? you can make sure this also works past the first singular time if, you, if your flow is, has only a generic singularities. Then the tangent flow could possibly have higher multiplicity. So you could have sheets coming together. Or the other possibility is that your tangent flow has a cylindrical end, but is not a cylinder. Uh, so exactly sort of a counter example to this, uh, to this uh, cylinder uniqueness conjecture. Okay. Now, interestingly, both of these sort of these count possible counter examples are conjectured not to exist. So both are conjectures of Tomna with the cylinder uniqueness conjecture would rule out that case. And um, the uh, there's another conjecture, multiplicity one conjecture, I guess one of the most fundamental conjectures in mean curvature flow that um, you can have only multiplicity one for these sort of singularity models. Yeah? So you can't have sheets coming together. That so much should still contradict the strong maximum principle. Now you could try now to say, okay, maybe I can perturb away these guys here. That's also an option. Or maybe you can even perturb away higher multiplicity. So these are also still options that you can try to do. Uh, you try not to prove the full conjecture, but you try to prove that generically this is still true. So yeah, this is this is work in progress. Um, now, and the important thing is we only need to perturb the initial condition. Uh, we can just wiggle the initial condition, and then we can more or less perturb away for the experts here these asymptotically conical singularity models. Okay, now let's give me give you a strategy of the proof. Are there any questions with this result? Maybe before I go to the strategy of the proof. I want to ask you a question later, but let's do it. Uh, okay. Yeah, we'll it. So, no. Okay. No. So the idea is the following. So we start with an initial hypersurface. Yeah? Let's do this here in blue. Do a picture. Yeah? And let's do a space time track here. So this is sort of a space time track. Yeah? Here are the singularities. Yeah? Okay. Yes, that's what we had before, the dumbbell. It's mean convex, it shouldn't be mean convex, but that's a bit easier to draw. Huh? The idea is then, um, I'll write this in the next page. Yeah. So this is this, this weak flow. Yeah. And now we embed the initial surface in a foliation of initial surfaces here. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we foliate a neighborhood of this initial surface. Yeah. These initial surfaces will have also weak evolutions, but we know that by the avoidance principle, which works also for these weak evolutions, these, these flows of the nearby surfaces have to avoid this mean curvature flow, this initial mean curvature flow here. So we get kind of a foliation, a local foliation of space time by flows. Okay, so that's the picture there. 
Okay, so this is this. So we consider foliation. This is MS around M0. Yeah? This is sort of what I've drawn here. Okay, now we embed this flow M0. This is sort of this, this dark blue flow here. Yeah? We embed this into a family of weak flows starting at these initial surfaces. So this is, gives a foliation of flows, which foliates space time. Okay, now what do we do? So we have first we have avoidance principle. These flows have to avoid each other. That means we get a foliation of, of space time. There might be gaps. That's not so important at the moment. Huh? And S here is this parameter of this of this foliation. Okay. Now we consider a singular point. Yeah? Now we, for example, here the singular point. We we do parabolic rescalings around this point. So this flow will converge to its tangent flow. So how does the tangent flow look like? Yeah. This would be here, in this case, it would be a shrinking cylinder. Yeah. It's a bit hard to draw this. Yeah. So it would look like this. You have something which is kind of parabola shape, but only in this one direction. Okay. Now you can look at this foliation. You blow up this foliation here at the same time. So you should still get sort of see some remnants of this foliation around this shrinking cylinder. And you can hope that since you're kind of blowing up and curvature gets large, that somehow you maybe you can tell, say something about this about this outside foliation of the shrinking cylinder in space time. Uh, you see the shrinking cylinder. Uh, for example, what you could do, you could foliate it by just translating the shrinking cylinder in time upwards and downwards. That would give a foliation. Or the shrinking sphere. Uh, if you remember from before, if you had a shrinking sphere here, uh, that the space time track looked like this. Yeah. If you just translate that space-time track up and down, you can foliate a neighborhood. You can foliate the, the, the space-time by, by other flows. Uh, and you see they're all avoiding each other. OK, so let's put it forward here. OK, so we have here, we blow this up. We take a, a sequence of rescalings so that this center flow here at the singular point converts to the tangent flow that was here, the cylinder. Now. Now we've we passed the whole foliation to a limit simultaneously. So we still fix this one center we had before on the central flow, but we blow up the whole foliation. We rescale the whole foliation. So most of the foliation will be blown away. We don't see much. No? But what we can do, you see, we can choose this parameter S carefully. More or less what we choose, we choose the parameter S such that in space time, this, this flow in S after rescaling has distance one to the space time origin. That's what we do. Yeah. Then you keep it away from the origin because the space time origin has to be in the tangent flow. Now you blow this up carefully. You choose it like this. And what you then see, you see that these, these blow-ups, if you choose these parameters right, they converge to a flow which sits on one side. Yeah? So right, it's a flow which is outside of this, of this tangent flow, which would be, for, for example, here the sphere. The shrinking sphere, or here the shrinking cylinder. It has it avoids this, and it's an ancient solution. Okay. So what do we get? Uh, you can do this. You can prove you get this non-empty flow in the limit from blowing up your foliation with the right parameter, and you get an ancient solution which stays on one side of this tangent flow. This is the self-similar guy. Just think of the sphere or the cylinder, shrinking cylinder. You get this ancient solution here. Okay, so what is the aim now? So the claim is what we can do is we show that this actually this one side, this the solution which lies on one side, that this guy is unique. And it's it's unique up to parabolic scaling. Now, if you think of like the shrinking cylinder, if you take a translated shrink, shrinking cylinder where you translate time and you scale parabolically, you get all the other, all the other shrinking cylinders. And the claim is that's the only thing you see. Or like the shrinking sphere, where you where you just translate the the, the, the sphere in space time, the, the space time track, you translate up and down. It's the only thing you can see. Now, but you see, and the claim is that this guy here actually is better behaved. That guy, so this 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 ancient one-sided flow has. So that's what we're trying to prove that that actually behaves better. Yeah? It has only generic only generic singularities. By understanding this guy, you want to pass information back down the sequence. And say, okay, then we can say we do this. If you take the right leaf in this foliation, then locally one of these leaves only has good singularities. Okay. 
Now, and what the idea is here, as I said before, uh, if you have surfaces, yeah, then you see, for example, if you have an asymptotically conical tangent flow that carries genus, and the idea is to prove that this one-sided perturbation loses genus. So this means this one-sided perturbation has lost genus. Now, just to, to sum this up in Nupture, if you want to do successive perturbations, so if you perturb once, we lose genus, or we can wait until that runs into another singularity, which might be asymptotically conical, but then the flow has lost genus, we can do another perturbation, we lose more genus, and we only have to do this finitely many times until we have killed all the genus. Okay, now let's understand this a bit better, sort of how do we get sort of this characterization here of this uh, ancient one-sided flow. Huh? Now, so this is our original central flow, M0. This is the singular point, and this is the tangent flow. And we assume it's smooth and has multiplicity one, so we can really write it sort of as we usually think about this, but this is a smooth shrinker, which is either compact or asymptotically conical. Okay, good. So one of these examples we've been looking at. Now, we have now this flow here, this M bar, which was the flow which lies on one side of this tangent flow. It's not equal to the, but lies on one side. Huh? Okay, but I guess many of people have seen this, there's a natural sca uh, scaling you can do. Um, you go to the rescaled flow, which exactly makes self-similar solutions, makes them static, static points of the equation. So this is the scaling you have to do. You more or less exactly sc uh, scale down with a factor one over square root of remaining time. Now. And so this is the rescaled flow. And this gives them mean curvature flow plus this forcing term, where this forcing term is actually exactly x perp over two. That exactly makes a shrink of um, stationary point of the flow. But the thing is, this one side, if this pose on one side, that's not a self-similar solution, but you can still scale it that way to give this, this rescaled mean curvature flow. And what you can check, actually, this, this flow is up to conformal factor, exactly mean curvature flow in this conformal metric here. Yeah. And remember, we had seen that in this conformal metric, this, the, the, the shrinker itself was a minimal surface. And now you, we know that sort of since these, this, this flow here, this M bar lies on one side of the shrinker, that this rescaled flow lies on one side of the stationary, in that this rescaled flow lies on one side of this self shrinker. Okay. Now we want to get more information. What you can do, you look at this ancient solution and the monotonicity formula, if you do this for this rescaled flow, says that if you go with this rescaled flow back to minus infinity, then this again has to converge to a self shrinker. It might be a different one it's called sigma prime. Yeah? It's more or less the tangent flow at minus infinity of this, um, of this flow in bar. Um, but the interesting thing is that this, this, or this metric here, it behaves in some sense like a metric with positive Ricci curvature. And if you remember, sort of Frankel's theorem says like if you have a, a co dimension one minimal surface, if you have two minimal hypersurfaces in a, met, in, a, in, a, in a manifold with positive Ricci curvature, then they have to intersect. That's a Frankel property. Yeah? Now, the interesting thing is this Gaussian metric here behaves in the same way. Yeah? And you can prove that these, this implies that these two shrinkers actually have to be identical because they can't lie on one side of each other. Up to multiplicity. Yeah? Um, now, I can tell you when we can control the multiplicity. So in the end, we can argue that actually this, this one-sided flow, as time goes to minus infinity, converges back to this minimal surface sigma. And yeah, now, remember, calling a mini Cosy have shown that up to this, the normal, the, the, the instabilities which all these minimal surfaces have, the only stable ones are the spheres and cylinders. But we have assumed we don't have a sphere and cylinder. Yeah? So there is, so more or less the second variation here has a negative eigenvalue. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a first eigenfunction for the, for the steepest descent going out of that, for the, for the, for the index here. Yeah? And you can actually prove that since this flows on one side, that this evolution, uh, it's, so the height function is positive, that evolution is governed by the first eigenfunction of the second variation of this minimal surface. Yeah? And the idea is then you prove that this flow for very large negative times is this entire smooth graph over this 
cell shrinker and use PDE analysis to prove that the flow is unique. So that's the idea now. And what do you get from there? Let's just give the statement here. So if you have a self shrinker, uh, that's the technical assumption since we use some results of Brian White, which haven't been completely extended to all dimensions, uh, uh, which is either compact or asymptotically conical. Then if you have a, an ancient solution to mean curvature flow on one side of the self shrinking solution, um, then it's unique up to parabolic scaling, you need this kind of multiplicity assumption here uh, that you don't have more than twice the Gaussian area as you go back to minus infinity. And the important thing is it comes to one side, the flow is shrinker mean convex. What means shrinker mean convex? This means H plus X comma nu over two is greater or equal than zero. Uh, so this means this rescaled flow moves in one direction. That's the idea. Uh, that's what you get then. Yeah? And um, what you can compare this with, uh, so the right comparison is if maybe some of you know, know, know minimal service theory better, um, there are this work of Hart, Simon and Smale where you look uh, one-sided foliation of area minim minimizing hypercones and they prove that there's unique star-shaped minimal surface on each side of an area minimizing hypercone in, in R8. Yeah? And that is unique. And in some sense, you should see this as a generalization to the, into the parabolic setting of this that proves that there's sort of an, an, an ancient one-sided solution to mean curvature flow. Um, okay, now here's a few more properties. Um, what we, we use sort of this, this um, shrinker mean convexity to extend sort of the regularity theory due to Brian White. Um, for, for the mean convex case, you can prove that this solution, although it has singularities, has only sort of generalized cylindrical singularities. Um, that translates to that at time zero, it's smooth and star-shaped. Yeah, it's, and you can then actually hear for the experts, what you can also prove if you have a non-compact shrinker, yeah, then this one-sided flow is also non-vanishing for all times. And the blowdown for positive time converges to an outermost expander associated to the asymptotic cone of sigma. Yeah. So it really sort of gives you kind of a shortcut from time minus infinity to time plus infinity going through, through generic singularities. Yeah. So in some sense, you should see this as a kind of canonical destabilization of, uh, these, of these shrinkers. Yeah. Yeah, so the idea is from before, if you look at this picture before where you have these necks, uh, you kind of push every second neck to the inside and you push every other neck to the outside and that gives kind of the this kind of canonical destabilization of this shrinker. Okay, and again here the star shapeness at time zero means gives you that we have lost genus, no? which is important. No? So this means we can, this is iteration now. And now maybe in the very end here, let me go to this to the last results here. Now here, uh, what is entropy? Entropy is you look more or less at this uh, at this Gaussian integral uh, from, from, from the monotonicity formula, but base it at any possible future time. Yeah? So more or less this quantity here controls the monotonicity formula at every positive future time, any positive densities. Now you can still use the monotonicity formula to prove that it's de decreasing on the mean curvature flow. And you can see this as a kind of Nonlinear quantity to give you some complexity measure of surfaces. Yeah? If you look at shrinkers, yeah, um, you can, for example, look at shrinkers at the most basic ones, the stable ones. You can check, okay, the lowest one if you, is this is the plane, yeah, that's which has uh, entropy one, and the next one is the sphere, the round sphere. Then you get a cylinder with one straight directions until you get this the cylinder with n minus one straight directions with the highest entropy. Yeah? So this is kind of the most symmetric case and this gets less symmetric until here. Yeah? Now, there's a work of Kolding, Ilman, Mini, Cosi and White, yeah? which actually shows that um, you don't only compare with other cylinders, but actually the round sphere has lowest entropy among all self shrinkers if, if you disregard the plane. The plane yeah? So in some sense, if you dis disregard the plane, this has the least complexity, which is reasonable. Yeah? There's later work by Bernstein, Wong, and Zhu. Yeah? He generalized it to higher dimensions. 
that actually the round sphere has lowest entropy among all closed hypersurfaces, yeah. which is also very reasonable to expect. And if you're in R3, there's very interesting work of uh, Jacob Burns and Lu Wang that you say, okay, is there anything, any other shrinker between now here in, in the R2, this would be S2, and this would be S here S1 cross R in R3. Is there any other shrinker between these two? And they show there's no other shrinker. No? There's nothing, there's a gap. Okay. And um, now, what also Jacob and Lou proved that if you are in R4, huh, and if you have entropy um, less or equal to S2 cross R, huh, I guess you need strictly less huh, or closed, then you can't be this, then you can actually prove you're diffeomorphic to S3, huh, which is, but diffeomorphic to S3 still leaves open the question if you're isotopic to S3, huh, because that's some sort of a version of the Schoenfries conjecture. Huh? Now, I'll come back to that later. So here are some results with low entropy. Let's go through this quickly here. Since my time is running out, so more or less we can. In Lou's, yeah. in Lou and Jacob's uh, thing, it's, it's just M diffie more, uh, uh, sorry. M doesn't have to be a shrinker. What, what's what's going in this one? What's the hypothesis on M? M is a closed hypersurface. Three, three dimensional hypersurface in R4. An entropy loss less than the entropy of S2 cross R. Then you're diffeomorphic to S3, but you're not isotopic to S3. Calling M be a shrinker. <laughs> but no, M is not a shrinker. M can be anything. Any, any closed hypersurface in R4 with entropy less than the entropy of S2 cross R. Huh? Then you're diffeomorphic. Then, it, then you have to. Then, then there's your hypersurface diffeomorphic to S3. Understand? Yeah. Not a shrinker. Okay. Um, now here's sort of what we did. So, but since my time is running, I'll skip a bit over this. Now, what we more or less proved: if we do an entropy assumption less than entropy two, yeah, and we are two-dimensional, then we can actually do the full perturbation. Uh, so entropy two is much stronger. It's much higher than this year. It's far above here. Yeah? So entropy less than two, then we can prove with the different, the much softer technique. Yeah? Then we can really do the full perturbation that we want. We only get spherical and cylindrical singularities. Yeah? And now here is if we are in R4, yeah? we can actually push pretty far. You see, this is already the second step. Yeah? So this is not here the first step. It's not this step, but even one step further. So the second step is like, if you're less than S1 cross R2, so this is called the bubble sheet, yeah? And the little epsilon, then we can also make everything generic if the whole entropy is less than that, yeah? Okay. Um, I'll maybe skip this, so at least this, we can do this. This works also as well here. Um, now let's give me sort of the application at the very end here now. Um, now, you can apply this here now, this result here. Now, if you have now entropy less than S2 cross R, huh? so this is sort of one stronger, this is still as strong as uh, what Jacob and Lou assumed, then actually we show that you can perturb the flow a little bit such that the mean curvature flow remains completely smooth until it disappears in a round point. Why? Because you see, you can do a perturbation, it's strictly less. So it rules out any kind of cylindrical tangent flows. You can't have a cylinder, we make it generic, this means there's no there's no singularity aside from the round shrinking sphere. And then you can argue there's only one singularity and that has to be the final singularity. Okay, now this gives an alternate proof of this low entropy Schoenfries theorem. So Jacob and Lou, at the same time as us, gave a proof that if you are uh, if you have an embedded hypersurface in R3 with entropy less than S2 cross R then you're actually smoothly isotopic to the round So this is the strengthening. Yeah? So this is this low entropy shrink fleece. Yeah? They have different, they also use, use mean curvature flow, about that, but they really try to push the whole isotopy through singularities. And we sort of do this perturbation and say, okay, we don't need to do this. We can do everything smoothly. Um, here's another recent result of a PhD student of mine. Yeah? So here's the assumption. Assume you have a 
um, so we do this assumptions unit regular cyclic Rocky flows in this weak solution of mean curvature flow but you a priori assume you only have spherical neck pinch singularities so there's an a dimensions so you assume singularities are either spheres or cylinders with only one straight direction yeah then actually you can do surgery you can approximate this flow by flows with surgery yeah? so you can actually control you can start surgery you can use this weak limit as a, as a way to control the surgery and prove you can do surgery flows which which um, uh, uh, which approximate this flow here and what is the corollary of this this means we can actually assume if we have a, a three dim a three dimensional hypersurface in our so that should be our four sorry here which is homeomorphic to s3 yeah? so that's the that's more the assumption of the of the schön fleece yeah? and we go one up now we go that, that the entropy is less than s1 cross r2 then it's smoothly isotopic to round s3 so what is the argument you know you take this then you use um, our perturbation result from the page before make the flow generic and then you use this approximation result of of joshua yeah? which says you can approximate by flows with surgery but now we can actually control the whole topology through the surgeries but since you know you have you were topolog topologically the sphere you never cut a handle and then you just do connect sums of spheres which is still an isotopy and then you get the isotopy to the round s3 and i will stop here thank you all very much for your attention thank you